Okay, welcome to the second in our series of five workshops on emotional sobriety. My name is John R. and I'm an average alcoholic, among other things. The Freethinkers Living Sober group is a secular AA group. Our group started in November of 2014 with about 13 members. And we now have four secular meetings a week, all of them on Zoom right now. Of course, a lot of folks are interested in emotional sobriety, not just alcoholics, so everyone is welcome. Um, the workshops from now on will be a little bit different from the original uh, webinar format uh, from last time. Instead of three hours, we anticipate about two hours, maybe a little less. Uh, every other month, a different panelist will give a half hour presentation on a topic they've chosen that's related to emotional sobriety. And today's topic is emotional sobriety and our center of gravity with uh, Dr. Alan Berger. It's going to kick us off. Then the other panelists will have a chance to make some brief comments and discussion. And then after a short break, we'll allow all the remaining time for a discussion from the floor. Anyone who wants to ask questions or make comments. And we're, we're really happy that you joined us for this workshop and I hope you find it useful and informative. We're also extremely honored and grateful to have the esteemed panelists for joining us today. Uh, they include uh, Dr. Berger and Maria Hornbacher, Joe C. And I'll be here as your meeting leader and moderator. Um, maybe a little bit about the, the uh, panelists. Um, Dr. Berger, of course, is a popular public speaker and nationally recognized expert on the science of recovery. Um, one of my favorite books of his is uh, 12 Smart Things. Um, that, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Uh, and Maria Hornbacher is a New York Times bestselling author, a journalist, poet, teacher. She's been nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. I'm so jealous. Her books include uh, Waiting, A Nonbeliever's Higher Power, and I think the most recent one is Sane, Mental Illness, Addiction, and the 12 Steps. And if you haven't read her work, I highly recommend my personal favorite for recovery is Waiting. We also have with us Joe C, who most of you probably are familiar with. He is the author of Beyond Belief, Agnostic Musings for a 12-Step Life, which is very popular in the secular AA community. Aside from being an author and a friend, he's also a dad, a songwriter, a radio host, a financial planner, and a jack of all trades. That's what I hear. We are happy to claim him as a member of our group also. So, and uh, so a little housekeeping real quickly. We really want to thank our, our support people in the background. John S., who's acting as our stage manager and overseeing things, and Kat L., who's going to be our timekeeper and the chat host. So thank you. We couldn't do this without you, that's for sure. Um, I also wanted to mention there's a, the chat function will kind of be shut down for the first part of it, but then we'll open it up. To, for everybody to be able to use. You can send a chat to uh, the individual panelists uh, or to John or Kat if you have a question that's more technical in nature. The audio for this webinar is being recorded. So it will be available for distribution on the website. So please keep anonymity in mind when you're asking or responding to questions or whatever. If if you want to change your name in your video, you can do that just by uh, rolling over the your video. And there's a function. Uh, if you click on the three dots, there's a function for renaming. Um, oops. Uh, so because there's a whole lot of attendees, there, I'm, I'm sure there will be a lot more than we even have now. Um, we we'll try to get to as many questions as we can and comments, but we'll probably not get to them all. And I think that's about it. It's my honor now to introduce uh, our presenter today, Dr. Alan Berger. Thank you for being here, Alan. Appreciate it. It's all yours, Alan. You're muted, Alan. All right, here we go. Well, good morning, everyone. 
here I am in uh, Southern California and I'm three, oh, starting my third week of recovery from COVID. So I will express to all of you, do everything you can to prevent getting this ugly virus. It has been debilitating, especially for the first week and I'm doing much better and hopefully I'll have enough energy to sustain myself through our this presentation this morning and I'll stay with you as long as I can today in terms of the discussion part of this. So without further ado, let me go ahead and share my screen with you because I've created some slides to, to facilitate my presentation this morning about a very, very important topic. All right. Okay, today we're going to dig into understanding our emotional center of gravity. And I think as, as we talk about this, you'll see what makes this so important in terms of emotional sobriety. But before I do, I want to talk about a few concepts because I love to put all of this stuff in context. You know, it's, it's a little known fact, and I think it's becoming better known, that Bill did see that the effect of working the steps was to achieve emotional sobriety. And this is what he said in the second paragraph in the 12 and 12. Now, remember that was written in 1950, so that we're looking at about 15 years, you know, into his journey um, with recovery. And he goes, here we begin to practice all of the 12 steps of the program in our daily lives so that we and those about us can find emotional sobriety. And we're all familiar with the idea that sobriety really involves physical sobriety and emotional sobriety. And we're gonna be focusing on the emotional sobriety part. But here are some of the concepts that Bill talked about related to emotional sobriety. And I list them because I think it's important to keep these in mind through all of the, the following presentations that we're gonna be having on this important subject. He described in his letter to someone out here in California who was struggling with depression, that emotional sobriety was real maturity and balance. Um, and this becomes an important thing. And you'll see that I, I'm gonna define maturity in the way that Dr. Fritz Perls defined it is the transcendence of environmental support to self-support. That'll become a lot clearer as I go into this discussion today. He also talks about balance and today is gonna to be focusing on our balance and our, our emotional balance in life. He also uses the phrase that, that emotional sobriety is humility in relationship to ourself and others. Um, so humility becomes a very, very, very important uh, cornerstone, if you will, of emotional sobriety because it, what it says is, is that, in fact, I'm, I think I'm going to take a minute and just read you the definition of humility that's in the American Psychological Association it's Dictionary of Psychological Terms. And here's the definition that they have, that humility is the quality of being humble, which is characterized by a low focus on the self an accurate, not over or underestimated sense of one's accomplishments and worth. And this is important. And an acknowledgement of one's limitations, imperfections, mistakes, gaps in knowledge, and so on. So what this turns out to be is that humility is really saying to us is that I have no business, you know, um, expecting other people to live up to my expectations. We're going to see that that becomes a critical part of this emotional sobriety. Now, somebody's not muted. Could that person please mute themselves? John, someone, I think somebody can do that. That's host or something like that. If somebody's not muted to get them muted. Emotional sobriety is also looking at our emotional dependence. And what that does is it creates a need for our possession and control of the people and circumstances surrounding us. Bill had a great insight into that. And I think it's incredibly important. He also discussed it as putting the cart before the horse. See, expecting that life is going to conform to our expectations creates this impossible way of life. Instead of looking at ourselves as those that need to somehow deal with life on life's terms. And it was about examining our emotional disturbance to identify our expectations and our unhealthy dependence. 
So these become an important thing. And then we're transcending our faulty emotional dependencies and, and that our dependencies need to be broken at depth. Well, you're gonna be seeing that all of these themes are gonna be picked up in today's workshop and in the, in the following workshops that we have from our panelists. Well, here's Ernie Larson and he, Ernie talked about stage two recovery. He defined stage one recovery as breaking the bonds of addiction, dealing, getting to a place of emotion or physical sobriety. And he just defined stage two recovery as getting at the underlying patterns and habits that caused us trouble in the first place. And if we take Ernie's work and, and we integrate it or synthesize it with what Bill Wilson is saying is that these patterns and habits that cause us trouble is our emotional dependency. And he goes on, if nothing changes, then nothing changes. The same results will pop up through our whole life. And so many people that are in recovery for a long period of time start to realize that they need to do some work on this issue on, on their expectations. So here's a few other things from the 12 and 12 that I think relate to this discussion today. Step four says, we learned that if we were seriously disturbed our first need was to quiet that disturbance, regardless of who or what we thought caused it. So here, Bill is talking about in emotional sobriety that we are taking responsibility for how we feel. And this becomes an important thing because for most of us, we blamed how we felt on other people. In fact, it's so prevalent in the language. You make me angry. You make me sad. You scare me. And it's all a deflection of our responsibility. Here he goes on to say in steps four, where other people were concerned, we had to drop the word blame from our language. This required a great willingness to begin and great discipline at the same time. Because it's so easy, it's so automatic for us to think about who's at fault. I like to say that, you know, if, if you had a mother that when the milk was spilt in the kitchen and you have a bunch of kids sitting around how the mother walks in that room is going to teach us a lot about this. If she walks in and says, who spilled the milk? What do we do? We're looking at who's the blame. If mom walks in a room and says, hey, let's get a rag and clean that up real quick. Some milk got spilled. We're not worried about who spilled the milk. We're worried about cleaning up the milk. And that's what emotional sobriety is about, is cleaning up the mess, not who's to blame for it. Step four is, says, in this part, Bill says, it says, it never occurred to us that we needed to change ourselves to meet conditions, whatever they were. So this is getting at that idea about the cart before the horse, is that we didn't ever look at ourselves as, as the ones that are being challenged by life, and that our job is to deal with whatever tasks, whatever challenges life is setting before us. And that is really what emotional sobriety is all about. It's learning how to cope with life as it is, not as we expect it to be. Now, how do we do that? Well, one of the things is, is we need to start to have a practice of self-examination. And I love what Virginia Satir says about this. She was one of the pioneers in family therapy. And she goes, when something goes wrong, I try to make a picture in my mind of a circle with myself in the middle. And then I ask myself, what part in my problem are my thoughts playing? Are my fears, are my expectations, my interpretations and my lack of faith to be able to grow? And I think this last one becomes so important because without a faith in our ability to learn how to cope with life and to grow from our experiences, we're going to end up being very, very fixed in our response to things without taking more of an experimental attitude is let me try this on and see how it works. And if it's not working, let me try something different. That's the heart of this emotional sobriety is developing some flexibility. So let's talk about this physical center of gravity. And, and it's a way of starting to talk about the emotional center of gravity. So our physical center of gravity is the point with which gravity is passing through us and connecting us to the center of the earth, right? That's what gravity does. It keeps us, our, our feet planted on, on the ground. Now, certain athletes like gymnasts, 
have really mastered their ability to manage their center of gravity when they're doing some pretty amazing feats, physical feats. You know, we see that this person who's on a balance beam, which is four feet wide, and is able to do some incredible, incredible gymnastics maneuvers and keep her center of gravity because she's connected and she's managing that well. When I was um, in the Marine Corps and I was over in Vietnam in uh, 1970 to 1971, we had um, two Korean Marines assigned to our unit to teach us Taekwondo. And one of the first stances they taught us was the horse stance, which is called the immovable stance. And here you can see this, this gentleman demonstrating it. He's got his knees a little bit wider than shoulder width apart. He's dropped down his, his pelvis in between his knees. And he's in a position of being very, very solidly planted his weight is equally distributed between both feet. And from this position, he can move and respond very, very well to any kind of a physical challenge is also to be aggressive from this position. Well, what this is telling us is that our ability to manage our, our physical center of gravity becomes very important in different athletic adventures, but even in life. I mean, you know, as you get older in life, you lose some of your muscles, you lose your balance, and a lot of people fall and injure themselves and break hips and things like that. Well, there's also, I think, an analogous part is what we're going to call our emotional center of gravity. And just like with a physical center of gravity, if you keep your emotional center of gravity over your two feet, then you're going to be well balanced in life. You're going to be able to deal with whatever happens in your, in your life. Now, we all start with that physical center of gravity being over our two feet. As a child, we haven't learned to, to externalize that center of gravity yet. So I have a little two-year-old, my daughter's name is Cecilia, and Cecilia is just who she is. If she wants some food, she says she wants food. If she needs to go to the bathroom, she goes to the bathroom while she's pot, you know, potty training now. And so now she'll ask her, bathroom, 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 bathroom. And we all sprint to the bathroom, right? And do that kind of a thing. But she is incredibly responsive to whatever her needs are. If she's tired, she'll come up to and say, I want a nap. She will take responsibility for that. Now, this is a wonderful thing. And I am certain that my wife and I will ruin that. And pretty soon what's going to happen, instead of Cece being okay because of who she is, she's only going to be okay if. And this is the point where we run into trouble. As soon as my being okay is dependent on what's going on around me, now I'm at the whim of those people that are in my life, their goodwill, their grace, their kindness, or their cruelty, or they're not in a good place that particular day. So if I'm okay only if my wife is in a good mood, then my mood's gonna to be totally dependent on her. If I'm okay only if I get that promotion on my job or I'm okay if this happens that way or that happens this way, then I'm gonna be okay. But it's so dependent on circumstances that are beyond my control. Yes, I can have some influence over those things, but for, for, you know, in a large degree, those things are out of my control. Now, how do we get to this I'm okay if thing? Well, look, it's, it's I believe, and I, I don't know if, if this is just a conspiracy the theory that's left over from my days of using LSD and my paranoia, but I believe there's a conspiracy against our true self. I don't think people are really interested in people being who they are. They're interested in people living up to some idea of how things are supposed to be or how you're supposed to act, how you should act and all those other things. And so we get a lot of messages early on. And I'll just can give you a little example of how this happens in the process. And there's a lot of other ways this happens, but let's just take Cecilia. She comes home from preschool one day and she walks in the room and she's so excited. 
daddy, 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 look at what I did today. Look at this drawing I made. Now, my response to that is going to be critical. Do I help CC keep her center of gravity over her feet? Or do I encourage her to be okay if? Now, if I do what most parents do that are being loving and concerned parents and say, my God, CC, that's wonderful. That's incredible. What an amazing picture you have. You're going to be an incredible artist when you grow up. Let me take your picture and put it on the TV or let me put it on the, on the refrigerator or let me tack it up on the window, on the door or whatever it is. If I do that, when Cece goes back to school and starts to draw again, what is she going to think? She's going to think, how is daddy going to like this? Is daddy going to be happy with this? Is daddy going to be excited? Now, let's say Cece comes home from school and this time she has another painting and she walks in, daddy, daddy. And let's say that I'm, you know, not feeling well. You know, I'm, I'm going into one of my COVID depressions, right? At this point in time, and I'm not as reactive. What happens to Cece's experience? Now she's going, oh my God, daddy didn't like this one. Now she's in a dilemma. She wants to please me. And what she did before to please me wasn't pleasing now. And now she's got to start to figure out, well, how do I please him? Now think about what happens if when Cece walked in the door, instead of me, you know, with all my good intentions, instead of me saying how wonderful it is what she did, if I say to her, wow, Cece, you're really excited. You're, you couldn't wait to show me that. You really had a lot of fun doing that today. What was fun about it? You know, honey, it's important to do things that make you feel good like that. Now, when Cece goes back to school in this second thing, what is she thinking about? She's thinking about what her experience is with it. She's not thinking about what daddy's going to say about it. She's thinking about what does this mean to me? So if I've encouraged her to keep her center of gravity over her two feet and pay attention to herself. Now, do you know how rare that is? How many times did you get a message like that in your life? How many times were you told that? That what your experience is is important and it's important to pay attention to it versus you're supposed to be this way. You're supposed to be that way. You're supposed to be this way at school. You're supposed to write this way. You're supposed to act this way. The rules go on and on and on ad nauseum. Now, what happens is as we grow up with this, I'm okay if, we become emotionally dependent. That's where the emotional dependency comes from. Now I start to change my personality. Instead of being who I am, I become this false self, this engineered self that's designed to try to get you to love me, to get you to, to approve of me, to get you to love, to, for me to belong and to be a part of your life. And that's, that's where all the trouble starts for us. It turns into a mess. We have the cart before the horse, as Bill said, emotional sobriety. No, it's a live person talking. You, somebody's got to mute themselves, please. Emotional sobriety is about taking that center of gravity and putting it back into ourselves so we become okay even if i'm okay even if things don't turn out the way that i want them to i'm okay even if my wife is not in a good place i can become okay i'm okay even if i don't get that promotion things don't work out the way i want them to so this becomes a very, very critical part of emotional sobriety. This is what Fritz Perl says about this. He says, our dependency, and this is, I'm okay if, our dependency makes slaves out of us, especially if this, does, if this dependency is the dependency of our self-esteem. If you need encouragement, praise, pats on the back from everybody, then you turn everybody into your judge or into your parent. We can see this same theme in what Virginia Satir is saying. We're always trying to get out of our emotional jail. But we think about that emotional jail is that we've got to get somebody else to let us out. Mostly we try by begging, threatening, or pleasing other people, trying to get them to do it for us. We don't know how to open up that jail cell ourselves. We think somebody else has to do it. 
This is what Dr. Nathaniel Brandon said about this. He goes, in my emotional impoverishment, I tend to see other people as essentially sources of approval or disapproval. I do not appreciate them for who they are in their own right. I see only what they can or cannot do for me. Now, these are three different master psychotherapists coming from very different orientations. They're talking about the same thing that Bill Wilson was talking about. The effects of this emotional dependency on our life. It's pernicious. It's a serious problem. And that's why emotional sobriety leads to emotional autonomy. Now, this is one of my heroes and heroines, I should say, in psychotherapy, Dr. Karen Horneich. She's often overlooked, and it's a pity because she, she was just brilliant. And she, in fact, had an institute at the time that Bill was getting sober. And much of Bill's writings, especially in his letter, I think, were influenced by Dr. Horneich's ideas and concepts. I don't know if he read her or if he was influenced by some of the members in the group that were in therapy with her, but she was brilliant. What she says at the core of this alienation from the actual self, right? When we, when we give up who we are to be what we think we should be, right? Become this false self. She goes, is the loss of, of the feeling of being an active determining force in our own lives. You see, our lives are now determined by what's happening around us rather than by who we are. And when I say recovery is about recovering our lost true self, that's what I'm talking about is that we have to go back to getting centered over who we are, not who we think we're supposed to be. She goes on to say, the integrity of a person is impaired. We can't have integrity if I'm not connected to who I am because of this alienation of the self. That's what that's what impairs our integrity. She goes, the unavoidable unconscious pretenses. I have to become a certain way to be okay. The also unavoidable unconscious compromises. I have to compromise certain values, certain things that I want if they're not going to be acceptable due to my unsolved conflicts. She goes, the self-contempt you know, that comes from this whole operation of, of rejecting ourselves. All these forces lead to a diminished capacity for being sincere with oneself. You see, we can wrap up all our problems is our diminished capacity to be sincere for ourselves. We don't take care of ourselves. We don't protect ourselves. Some people are talking about recovery right now as a failure for, to protect our safety, right? It's a safety issue. Well, how can you look out for yourself if you have a diminished capacity to be sincere with yourself? Well, you can't do that because you're not grounded in who you are. Dr. Brandon says this, if I do not feel lovable, then it's very difficult for me to believe that anyone else loves me. And what I'm gonna do is go on looking for you to make me feel what I don't feel. If we're in a relationship, it's gonna be your job to make me feel lovable. It's gonna be your job to make me feel okay. And you don't want that job. You didn't sign up to be my caretaker if you're in a relationship with me. You know, what, what a relationship is about is to grow each other. It's are people growers. It's, they're not, they're not um, nursing homes. Oh, I love this one. She goes, if you are not eternally showing that you live for me, then I feel like I'm nothing. Right? That's what this emotional dependency does. It totally makes my experience of myself dependent on how you're, you are with me. Well, that's an impossible way of life, isn't it? Now, this is Byron Katie, and Byron really taps into a lot of this stuff. She goes, we use our beauty, our cleverness, our charm to capture someone for a partnership is as if he were an animal. Well, some guys are, but that's another topic at another time. I'll let Joe talk to that later on. Um, he goes, and then when he wants to get out of the cage, we're mad when he's not going along with our rules, right? That's the way I think about this. That doesn't sound very caring to me because it's really not caring. You know, when I'm demanding people do what I want them to do, that's not love. That's control. That's taking hostages. She goes, that doesn't sound very caring to me. It's not self-love. This is the key to mature love. I want my husband to want what he wants and to do what he wants to do. That's what love looks like. 
And she goes, and I also notice that I don't have a choice. She doesn't have a choice, but she can make it, you know, you know, easier for him to take that stand or more difficult. And that then, you know, comes to his ability to stay centered over his emotional center of gravity. She goes, that's self-love. He does what he does. And I love that. I mean, get, get your head wrapped around that. He does what he does. And I love that. That's what I want because when I'm at war with reality, it hurts. When I try to get someone to live their life according to my expectations, I'm at war with reality. There's no room for that other person. This is uh, Dr. James Hollis, and you're going to see how this sh shows up in relationship. He goes, the four principles that operate in our relationships. He goes, number one is what we do not know about ourselves and what we cannot do for ourselves will be projected onto our partner. I'll take that in for a minute. What we don't know about ourselves and what we cannot do for ourselves will be projected on our partner. So I'm going to expect you to take care of me. That's what I'm going to expect unconsciously when I walk into a relationship. Number two, we project our childhood wounds, our infantile longings, and our individuation imperative onto our partner. Individuation imperative, think about that as self-actualization, our desire to become what we can be. So we now make our partner responsible to take care of all these things. They're gonna heal us. They're gonna become the mother or the father that we never have. They're gonna give us the experiences we never had. They're going to reverse the trauma that we had in our past. And they're going to make us whole. They're gonna make us <laughs> feel good all the time. Somebody once again is unmuted. And if you could mute yourself, I'd appreciate that. So we project onto our partner the responsibility to do for us what we aren't able to do for ourselves. That's what happens with this emotional dependency at an unconscious level. A third principle that operates is that since our partner cannot nor should not bear responsibility for our wounds, for our narcissism or our individuation, our projections, which are our demands or our unenforceable rules, give way to resentment, which results in the problem of power and manipulation. It starts to turn into all the you should do this. If you loved me, fill in the blank. If you love me, you'd behave this way. If you love me, you wouldn't talk to me that way. If you love me, you'd know what I want even before I asked you. These are all of the unenforceable rules that show up in our relationships. And the fourth principle is that the only way to heal a faltering relationship is to take responsibility for our own individuation. In this case, to take our responsibility for our emotional sobriety, to raise our level of differentiation. Um, differentiation, just think about it as reflecting our level of functioning in a relationship. The more interdependent we are in a relationship, the more undifferentiated we are. The more autonomous we are, the more um, differentiated we are in a relationship. So Byron Katie goes on to say, so if your partner is angry, good. If there are things about him that you consider flaws, good, because these flaws are your own. You're projecting them and you can write them down, inquire and set yourself free. People go to India to find a guru, but you don't have to. You're living with one. I love that. You're living with one. Your partner will give you everything you need for your own freedom. That's why I say trouble in a relationship doesn't mean something's wrong. That is supposed to happen when you struggle and have conflict in your relationship. It's because of these expectations. It's an opportunity to get this stuff cleaned up. This is Dr. Karen Horne again. She goes, the aim of therapy is to help a person abandon his drive to actualize the idealized self, the false self, and move towards becoming who they are. Self-realization, self-actualization. This is Dr. Jerry Greenwald. He was a Gestalt therapist at UCLA. He goes, it's not possible for me to relate to others intimately and allow and enjoy their full expression of themselves if I have not discovered how to do this for myself. So we talk about this idea that you have to love yourself before you can love someone else, but it really goes a lot deeper than that. That unless you can embrace yourself as you are, 
and enjoy yourself and encourage yourself to be who you are, then when you're in a relationship with someone, you're not going to be able to give them that if you can't give that to yourself. What's going to happen is you're going to generate all of these rules. And every time that you have a rule about how somebody has to be for you to be okay, you have taken your emotional center of gravity and put it in them. If you are looking for other people to approve of you, like Dr. Fritz Perl said, then you've taken your emotional center of gravity and given it to them. And that's the heart of our problem. So what we're trying to do here is she says the essential goal of therapy, I would say of recovery is to help us liberate and strengthen the constructive forces within us. These are the constructive forces of our true self, the forces that take Cece and make her want to learn how to walk. I didn't have to stand over her when she was at about 10 months old. She had a desire that was growing within her to be what she could be. That's this force and, you know, that moves us to towards wholeness. She wanted to actualize and realize her ability to, to be ambulatory, to be able to move in the world, to mobilize herself and to stand on her own two feet. And neither her mom nor I stood over and say, okay, you're at 10 months old. Let's start crawling because you got to learn how to walk here pretty soon. You don't have to do that. She wanted to do that. You want to do that in your life. You've just gotten in the way with all of these nonsense ideas of what you think is supposed to happen for you to be able to do that. And hopefully we're going to get rid of some of those today. And I love this part. We must not allow other people's limited perceptions to define us. So if I am emotionally dependent on you and you say something like, Alan, you're a real, you know, you're stupid. And if I haven't dealt with this stuff and I want you to, to approve of me, I'm going to say, well, how dare you talk to me that way? You know, that's not very respectful. If I'm centered over my two feet, I'd say, God, I know I'm stupid. How, what did I do now? I don't have to defend it. I could take a look if there's some reality to it. Or I could say, you know, I agree with you. I can do stupid things. Can you love me even though I'm stupid? <laughs> I mean, that becomes a question you might not be able to. That's okay, too you know, whatever happens. But I don't need somebody else's perceptions to define me. And at one point down the road, if we do another series of these, I want to take a whole thing and talk about not taking things personally, because that's what this comes into, or this what it relates to so strongly. So in 12 Smart Things, the book that John was referring to, I say, remember, emotional sobriety helps you know yourself, know where your center is and hold on to it. One of the things you need to learn to do to hold on to your center is to stop letting other people edit your reality. This becomes incredibly important. If someone has an idea or opinion, it's theirs. It doesn't have to be yours. But what happens is, unfortunately, our emotional dependency pulls for a certain kind of togetherness or connection. It demands that we feel the same and think the same if we are to feel close to another person. That reflects a low level of emotional maturity. As you grow yourself along these lines of emotional sobriety, you're going to see that separateness is not a disruption of connectedness. It's just another dimension of it. Being different and having a different idea is not a disruption of a relationship unless there's this rule that says we can't have our differences. And what emotional sobriety does is as you're working on it and as you strive for it, it creates room for two people in a relationship. There's room for you to be yourself and room for your partner to be yourself. Bill calls it true independence of spirit. That's what emotional sobriety looks like. So Virginia Satir kind of wraps it up when she says, life is not what it's supposed to be. It is what it is. It's the way we cope with it that counts. And if you can co cope with life by staying over your own two feet, keeping your emotional center of gravity, you're going to cope with things much better. And here's another tip from Dr. Fritz Perls. He goes, if you understand the situation you are in and you let the situation you're in control your actions, then you learn how to cope with life. 
This is very different than demanding that the situation you're in be what you think it should be and then struggling with that. And instead of that, learning how to be able to be responsive to what is true and then learning how to deal with that. Well, it's amazing when you um, read um, Dr. Viktor Frankl's work called Man's Search for Meaning, and especially part one of his book, where he talks about his experience in the Nazi concentration camps. And he talks about this is the, the exact situation that helped people grow through their experience. They had to let go of any expectation of how they were to be treated and instead see themselves as men and women who were being challenged by what life expected from them and that meaning in their life came from figuring out the best response to that situation at the time. Well, that's living in the here and now, isn't it? That's the power of now that Eckhart Tolle talks about. So I hope this has given you some sense, experience of what this is about. I've got this unpacking Bill's letter on emotional sobriety. You can get that on iTunes. You can get it on my website. And John talked about some of my books that are available all on Amazon and through. And this is my contact information. So if you'd like to get on my mailing list here about other workshops and stuff that are coming up, then please go to www.abphd.com and just two other things on Thursday nights when COVID started I decided I wanted to give something back and we've started an emotional sobriety anonymous meeting Thursdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Both John and Joe have spoke at that meeting and and it's quite a it's quite a great group of people and uh, we're now walking through the steps and talking about how they help people achieve emotional sobriety. It's Thursday night from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. The ID number is 330-149-513. And if somebody could put that in chat, I'd appreciate it. 330-149-513. Password 375 986 375 986 and just the other plug is I started a podcast with my good friend, Tom Rutledge. It's called Start Right Here, conversations about what matters most. And you can find us on uh, Apple Podcast or on Spotify. So with that being said, I will stop sharing my screen and now turn this discussion over to my esteemed colleagues here. John, you're still uh, muted. I'm posting your your uh, information in there for the uh, Emotional Sobriety 12-step meeting. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah. Well, I thank you very much, Alan. That was a lot to chew on. I'm sure that uh, Joe and Mario probably have a few comments to make. Who would like to start? Joe would. <laughs> OK, Joe, go for it. <laughs> You're muted still, Joe. I'm working on it. <laughs> well, hurry up. Uh, yeah. So, uh, can everyone hear me now? Good. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, I'm Joe. I'm an alcoholic animal. Part of me will always be oh, an alcoholic. Part of me will always be an animal. <laughs> Just how it is. Um, uh, you know, I. There were a couple of things that really uh, uh, struck me, and uh, um, especially your slide with uh, Karen uh, Hornbay, um, the idea of when I'm not in my emotional center of gravity, uh, I am so prone to giving up my integrity, you know, like who I am, right? Um, like some things don't need self-regulating. My temperature is uh, 37 degrees. Well, for you Americans, it'd be 98.6, but for the rest of the world, 37 degrees is sort of a normal. And if it, there are times when it has to be uh, colder or hotter just to correct something in me, and my body sort of does that by itself. And if it can't re-regulate, I die, right? But my emotional sobriety, there's nothing 
nothing that sort of self-regulates me. I, I need to do some work uh, to do that. I, I don't naturally come that way. And I, and I really think um, maybe it's true of the sort of secular uh, sort of recovery community as a whole. Um, I, I don't know that, that we're smarter than others, but, but maybe we rely more on our intellectual prowess and it's, it's our coping mechanism for getting through in the world. And, and in my case, and I can't speak for the others, I kind of use that to overcompensate for any weaknesses I have in sort of emotional intelligence. Uh, where I'm not quite, you know, uh, comfortable is, you know, dealing with my feelings and your feelings. So I intellectualize that a lot. And, um, uh, and one of the areas where I can easily give up my authenticity is when I need acceptance. When I first came to AA, for instance, I needed uh, their acceptance. So I was willing to give up a certain amount of authenticity. It goes back even further than that. The drug culture I hung out with, I had to perform certain rituals. I had to adopt a certain language just to be, find my way into the in-group. And um, uh, that, you know, and I lost myself in that. I, I had no idea who I was by the time I got to, uh, recovery. I, I did not know what my value system was. You know, I wasn't clear on what my core values were. I, I couldn't tell you what mattered to me. You know, it was really dependent on uh, what my uh, partner thought or what you thought or what I was reading between the lines, what everybody else said. And, um, you know, this need for uh, the idea that uh, one of the things you said is that my being different doesn't threaten the uh, uh, relationship that I'm in. And so my being different doesn't threaten my relationship with AA. And my being different doesn't uh, threaten my relationship with a life partner or my kids, right? You know, like I don't need to, you know, what could be sicker than me needing their approval, right? You know, and uh, I mean, they're adults now, but um, uh, that uh, example of, of, you know, instead of feeding the child the needed, like, emotional uh, rise of, oh, what a beautiful picture, la, 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 to sort of help them regulate themselves, I, I think is just, well, it was mind-blowing. You know, I only hope I can remember that the next time I get a 3 a.m. phone call from an AA member which is bound to happen in the next little while, right? Um, and, and I actually, when uh, you went through that, I did get a lot of good guidance uh, personally. Like I would try to fight on, like, like I would want, uh, you know, um, uh, my sponsor to change AA for me. I would want, uh, you know, like, you know, I just, and he would say, uh, okay, well, uh, you, how, how, how is it for you? Like, what are you going to do? What, what, for, don't tell me what you don't believe. Tell me what you do believe. Don't tell me what you don't want. Tell me what you do want. How are you going to get that? How's that? What's that look like for you? And there was never any, you, you know, sort of, I, I could see he had this capacity. He didn't try to instill conformity in me. He didn't try to beat me down. He tried to help me find my own sort of regulation. And um, yeah, yeah, and my emotional sobriety now requires context. You know, sometimes I'm not the center of the story we're talking about, and I have to have some context in that, right? Uh, like my kids, my sponsees, my coworkers, they're the hero in their own story, and I've got to know where I fit into that, what my role is, because. I, I always have a tendency of, you know, building the world around me left to my own sort of untrained, unthoughtful devices. And uh, I remember someone said uh, in a higher Palooza talk that they had a rule of the three drunk rule. Whenever they had a great idea, they would talk to three drunks, <laughs> pass it by them. Drunks you trust, right? And, uh, and get some 
honest feedback from it to sort of see where that stands. Because if, if I don't do that, I'm lost in my own magical thinking, which just isn't isn't good for anybody. More animal. Anyway, uh, that's enough for me for now. Thanks, Joe. Maria, do you have any comments you want to make? I do. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks, Alan, for such a remarkable talk and <clears throat> wonderful topic. And thank you, Joe, for your additions. Um, what I what I actually spent a lot of time thinking about there was um, how how when I when I'm working from a spot that is not terribly emotionally sober, that is not terribly emotionally like serene or mature, what I'm doing there isn't just um, failing to grow; it's failing to appreciate other people. Uh, one of the things that really struck me by what, what Alan said was when I'm in a, a dynamic where things aren't as I like them, if I'm focusing on this isn't as I like it, it's how I would have it. Um, you know, Dr. Satir says, you know, life isn't how it's supposed to be. It, it is how it is. Um, and other people also aren't how they are supposed to be in the world, according to Maria, but they are how they are. And if I'm busy thinking about, well, this isn't as I would like it. And if I could rearrange this, that, and the other thing, it would be better for me. I'm still acting as if the world is the world in all the, you know, the cosmos as a whole is in orbit around me. You know, the world actually may well be as it's supposed to be. It may not work for me, but that's kind of my issue, not yours. Um, and so that, that when I am fixed on it isn't how I like it. It isn't what I want. It isn't the way I want it to be. I'm not seeing the beauty or even the, the interesting and productive and generative challenge that exists in how it actually is. You know, is the world how I'd like it right now? No, but there are lots of interesting aspects that then give me an opportunity to grow, to become, to do something more with me. If the world keeps defaulting back to, well, we need to suit Maria's needs right now. The world gets really boring really fast. Uh, it stops growing. I certainly stop growing. If you guys need to arrange yourself to suit my mood, we're all in deep shit for one thing, but we're also all just feeding my ego endlessly and incessantly. And wow, I spend enough time doing that on my own. So we don't all need to do it. However, if I get into a spot where I'm okay with where I'm at, regardless of what's going on out there in you, in them, in her, in him, and in the world, if I get okay, I am better situated to, as it says in some of our literature, I am better suited to become of service to other people. When I'm defaulting to, it isn't how I like it. I'm actually being pretty useless to you, to anyone, because I'm busy feeding myself. This is my complaint, this is my need, this is my desire, my, 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 my. And that's wasteful. You know, I'm too old, I think, at this point to really indulge myself in the idea that we all need to rearrange things to make me comfortable. That hasn't happened yet. It's not going to happen soon. If I keep waiting for that, I don't have a lot longer to spend indulging that notion. So what I think about in terms of what I need to take away from this as a listener is really to think about what am I missing when I'm focusing on this sort of narcissistic, I don't like how it is. What am I missing? I'm missing you. I'm missing this person over here. I'm missing the opportunity to grow in X, Y, and Z ways. I'm missing the relationships that I do have as they are with people as they are right now. And if I'm busy missing those things, what do I have at the end of the day? Me. And the last thing I wanna say is, you know, and I'm fine, but I'm not all I want in this life. You know, I'm not, I'm not the full sum total of what needs to be attended to. Um, I think a lot of my students often talk about, like students recently have said, what are you working on? And I've said, I'm working on a book about solitude in women's lives. And this may be particular to women identified people here, but they go, oh, I hate solitude. And I'm like, why? They're like, oh, I hate being alone. It just makes me so anxious. And I'm like, well, how uncomfortable that must be to go through the world, not fitting into your own skin at all. That must be terribly itchy all the time. But I'm also real aware of that, that, that we go through periods like that. And part of emotional sobriety for me is being okay with who I am, whether you're there or not. Like children, little infants, they mirror parent, like parent mood. Like you come in and you smile at your baby, your baby smiles right on back. I don't need to do that at my age. I don't, if you're smiling at me and I'm still grumpy, I get to be grumpy. Same way, if I wake up and you're a jerk today, I don't have to be a jerk back. 
Like I get to have my own individuated experience of the world and that is freedom. And that's what I think about when I think about emotional sobriety is that freedom that it buys us, the freedom to be who we are as we are and to move through the world in an independent and peaceful way, unimpeded by other people's needs for who we are supposed to be. So that's all I got on that off the top of my head. Thanks, Maria. Well, um, before we we take a little break, I would like to say that for me, uh, I've been at this for a little while, and for me, it's about progress, not perfection. <laughs> uh, we, I was just talking with my wife about, the, um, I have, I was sitting in a meeting and I shared in the meeting about some things uh, uh, that happened to touch on some Buddhist concepts. And, um, and that wasn't really the central part of what I was trying to talk about. And then the next person that shared started in what I perceived as instructing me in Buddhism. <laughs> and I've only been studying this for about 35 years. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so he was explaining to me how I should really believe in God because, which I don't, because in Buddhism, there's this concept of, you know, blah, 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 and all that. But what I found interesting was my reaction to that. Why did I react like, why is he trying to tell me something? <laughs> you know? And I doesn't he know who I am and what I already know? And, and it's like, what is that about? How do I let go of that one? You know, and, and uh, so, like I said, I've been at this for a while, <laughs> but I still have a ways to go. Somebody told me one time, this doesn't take long, just about 20 minutes longer than a lifetime. And uh, <laughs> so that's kind of what I was thinking about with this is, and that and sort of the practical idea of, okay, so how do I do that? And I think the steps are a really good start to um, taking a, you said something about uh, people don't let somebody else define your reality. I hear people talking all the time. Well, this is my reality, and I'm like, well, what if your reality is delusional? Because <laughs> I had a really delusional reality, and if I'm gonna hold on to that rigidly, maybe I'm missing something, and I was missing something. So. Anyway, uh, th those were kind of the thoughts that, that came to me. And, and I have a feeling that one of the things I'm going to want to talk about is, is uh, when I get my shot at this, is um, this concept of differentiation and how it relates developmentally to the ego. Um, that's not what we're going to talk about now. But <laughs> so anyway, uh, thank you all. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a little bit of a break and then we're going to come back, open it up for uh, for everybody to have a chance that wants to to share, ask questions if you want to of our panelists, and uh, and we'll go from there. Um, so let's take about five minutes, and then we'll be back. Thank you all.
Well, thank you, everybody. Um, by the way, I know that there was a problem with the link that was on the web page. Uh, evidently, the the um, security that they use for for it to do a direct link where you don't have to put in the password was an old one, and so it wouldn't work. But people are be being able to get in by just putting in their uh, the ID and the password separately. So hopefully the next time we do this, I will have resolved that problem. Um, I wanna mention a few things before we jump into it. Um, the audio for this webinar is getting recorded and it's going to be distributed or available over the website. Uh, you can check the chat for the website uh, URL. So keep your anonymity in mind if that's important to you when you're responding to or asking questions. Um, there are a lot of attendees here. Uh, not quite sure what the count is at this point, but it's well over 100. So uh, we may not get to everybody's questions. <laughs> to participate, in case you don't know, if you want to ask a question or make a comment live, you can do it in the chat. But if you want to do it live, please use the raised hand function. If you want to raise your hand, the button is under the participants panel. You'd have to click on participants. And at the bottom of that on the Zoom app is an icon for raised hand. Um, please remember to unmute yourself when you're called on and uh, mute yourself back again when you're done. If you're calling in, you'd press star nine on the phone to raise or lower your hand uh, and star six for muting and unmuting. Please keep your audio muted until it's your opportunity to share and keep your comments relatively brief, brief about three minutes. We're going to, we have a timer and Kat will let you know if you've reached the three minutes, to, then you can start to wrap it up because um, we have a lot of people here. And uh, that's about it for, the, for that. Um, and I think uh, unless, does one of the participants, one of the panelists want to, say any additional comments or can I go ahead and all right having not heard anything Francesca would you like to unmute yourself and yeah hi I'm Francesca can you hear me yes I can okie dokie so I'm Francesca I'm an alcoholic and an addict and um I really love this idea you know this whole thing about emotional uh sobriety I remember once when I was, I, I live in New York City and uh, I was at a meeting, my usual like meeting on 15th street and down the block was a men's meeting and my brothers used to go there. In any case, um, a, a gentleman came out, he was an older gentleman and I asked him, I said, oh, so how many years do you have? He said like 40 years, something like that. And, um, and I said to him, how do you do it? What, how did you get like 40 years, you know, like, how do you do that? And he said, emotional sobriety. And I never forgot that. I was like, wow. And then, you know, these meetings started with emotional sobriety. And it's like, um, it's such an eye opener, you know, I just, I love me, you know, listening to people and so many people have so many brilliant things to say and to share. And I don't want to take up too much time, but, you know, in just in, in regard to my own life, you know, this is the kind of thing that um, I, ha I have a son that I raised in recovery. Um, I was five years sober when I had him. He was the greatest gift of my life. And he still is. You know, he's a lovely young man. And there are things about uh, things that he does or does not do. Or I, I mean, I know, like, from business, you know, how he could do certain things and maybe better himself, whatever. But you know what? I have learned to stay out of that area of his life because I feel that if he wants my advice, he'll ask for it. You know, I don't have to like uh, stick it to him or, or, or like plagiar, you know, like, like, constantly badger him or, you know or even subtly I just don't I just stay out and I think that that served me well because Shane that's his name when he does want to know um, about something 
from me, he will ask. We have a very open, you know, dialogue going on and always have had that. And um, I think that's sort of like the good news. That's sort of like how you get to be able to broach certain, you know, emotional kinds of areas, you know, emotional areas of our lives interacting with uh, other people. Um, we need to allow them to be themselves. And I mean, I, I guess I've always lived my life the way I've wanted to. And, um, and then I got, you know, in trouble. <laughs> Part of my wanting to was getting in trouble with drugs and alcohol. So when I got out of that trouble, up. okay. Uh, I, anyway, emotional recovery is something I really want to continue to learn about. So I thank you all. Bye. Thank you, Ashley. Unmute thank you. yourself. Hi, I'm Ashley. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I have a question for the panelists. Um, over the last two weeks, I've lost two family members, and um, to say it's been devastating has been an understatement. So I wanted to ask um, how you remain not only emotionally sober, but quite literally just sober um, while going through grief. Would uh, one of the panelists like to take that? Alan, would you like well, to? Well, I'll go ahead and respond to part of it is that, look, you're, you're clearly there's a lot of grief going on for you now. And, and to give yourself a lot of space to have that, you know, it goes back to something Joe was saying before is that, you know, how, how do we learn how to regulate in ourselves emotionally? And part of it is allowing ourselves to have the experience we're having and not try to put a bunch of shoulds on it. And, and, you know, you may grieve for a few months. It might take you a couple of years to deal with the loss you've had right now. And, and to just let there be a lot of space about that. The second thing is that, you know, you're saying is how do I stay sober through something like this? Well, you know, my, I, you know, for me, my alcoholic self will use a situation like that and say, see, life is not what it's supposed to be. You might as well get drunk. And it's like, where do I, you know, get put in this idea that somehow I'm not supposed to go through grief and loss. That's a part of my experience here. And part of what I'd rather do than, than to get hung up and objecting to what's going on is to lean more into the feeling, although gently, but lean into it and let myself feel the grief. And if there's some unfinished business with those people, because that complicates, you know, bereavement in many ways. Sometimes I've got resentments or there's been some situations that aren't fully resolved and stuff. So I get to work on dealing with that. And, you know, and it's the great thing about emotional sobriety is, I don't need that other person sitting across from me to deal with my feelings. I can put them across to me, whether they're there or not, and say what I need to say. Write them a letter, do whatever I can to take care of myself. You see, that's the freedom of emotional sobriety. I don't need someone else to take care of my business. I need to have to pay attention to what I need to say, what I need to express, what I need to deal with. So this is an opportunity for you to get you know, to start to develop this emotional sobriety. This is the task that life is setting before you and to see what you can do to, to process and digest this experience. Because if you are able to do that in a good way, you will grow yourself from this experience. There's no question about it. It's how we digest these things. It's not what happens to us. It's our relationship to what happens to us and how we digest it that counts. So I hope you'll take advantage of this opportunity. Thanks, Alan. Uh, Kathy? Hi, I'm Kathy from Michigan. And um, I would uh, like some advice on how to deal with situations. Well, let me say that before sobriety, I used to think of myself as a doormat. You know, anybody could walk all over me. And uh, when I got sober, I said, no, I'm not going to do that anymore. You know, I'm going to stand up for myself. So if I see a situation, let's say, I mean, this is 
say with my husband, if I see a situation where there's some unfairness going on, like I'm doing all the work around the house. And I think that we should share the work around the house. I don't necessarily want to change him, but I do need to voice my concern about that unfairness and stand up for myself. Um, how do you suggest I should go about doing that? Hmm. I could speak to that real quickly, if that's all right. Thanks, Maria. Yeah, I think for me, the, uh, the art of boundaries is super difficult. It's a balancing act, and I don't think we're ever perfectly balanced, or if we are, we're going to tip, right? So, but the art of boundaries in relationships of any kind, for me, becomes about, becomes a matter of figuring out where do I end, where do my needs end, and where do I begin trying to meet your needs and manipulate you? So when I'm thinking about like, I've been a doormat for so long and I can't take it anymore. Now I'm going to be the opposite of a doormat and I'm going to steamroll everybody. That is not bounce, balance. That is not boundaries. That is simply reversing my old behavior that was ineffective to being a new behavior that is equally ineffective and equally destructive to me and others. So when it comes to boundaries and it comes to stating a need or stating this needs to be done, there is only so far I can go. And if I, if I go that far and say, this is where, this is where I am. Here's my square of sidewalk. Please keep it clean. You can make a mess of your square of sidewalk. That's totally fine. But if we are sharing this square of sidewalk, pick up the chair. If you can pick up the chair, that's fine. You can live in the garage. You know, I mean, there's like, there's a reasonableness and then it edges into unreasonableness very quickly. So that fine art of understanding what exactly do I really need? Not just the bare minimum of what I can live with, but what do I need at a healthy level? What's nourishing in a relationship? What's healthy for me? And what can I give? That is that constant weighing out of uh, being you know, respectful of my needs and being respectful of another person's needs. And it isn't something I learn quickly. It's an, it's an art, as, you know, as John says, you need an extra 20 minutes after we're gone to get it right. But I do really recommend the 12-step programs that involve codependency for learning more about boundaries and figuring out where they belong and where they're healthy for you to have them. So I hope that's of some use. Thank you, Maria. And a resource um, that's available is um, what's called nonviolent communication. Um, and you can, you can just Google that and find all kinds of material about nonviolent communication, which is very helpful for emotional communication. Joe? Yeah, I was uh, going to say relationships and even going back to the previous share about uh, loss, you know, death can't end a relationship course physically it does but uh th there's still like uh you know people that are important to me whether we're estranged uh whether death occurs like I i've got these relationships with them and w one of uh the great slides uh alan showed was how it talked about how if i don't know myself i don't even know what needs i'm looking to those other people to uh provide for me. Like uh, I'm walking around with uh, my plug socket to plug in somewhere. I need your energy. I need your love. I need your approval. I need your direction. I need something, right? And um, yeah, anything worth doing is worth doing badly. Uh, sobriety is worth doing badly. And John, uh, just before the break, talked about um, you know, it's progress, not perfection, and especially at a time of difficult relationship dealing because they're right there in your face in the same house or a recent loss. Um, you know, just, you, you know, it's not about perfection. That's not available. <laughs> so what else do I got? I got, as, you know, how can I improve the situation and, and, and just get through another day? John, let me just say... Quick, quick response to that. So, so Kathy, I think that uh, the issue for me is, first of all, you could say whatever you want. I, I, I wouldn't put it into this fairness thing because it's, you know, fairness is depending on how you look at it and stuff. It's a rule you have about how somebody's supposed to behave. And he's not here to live up to your idea of what fairness is. That's your thing. So for me, it would be, I'd like you to help out more. 
That's what the discussion needs to be. It's just that clean. And he may say, I'm not interested or I am. And then you got to just deal with what is. If he's not, you can tell him, well, that pisses me off or whatever it is. I wish, I wish you'd feel more the way I wanted you to feel. I can't make you feel that way. But it's your, I'd like to know, is there something that could entice you more into being a part of that? Because it would mean a lot to me. But if it doesn't, then you just got to look at, you know, doing what you want to do or not, or whatever it is, whatever that means for you. But see, it starts with just saying what you want. I'd like you to do this. And if the person isn't interested, then you got to just say whatever is next for you at that point in time. You know, maybe then you stop cleaning too. And then you see what happens, see who can wait the longest in terms of cloudy through it. I don't know. But see, if, if you, if you take it to that way, then you get rid of the rules. And that's what we're talking about. Dump the rules. There, you got to get rid of the rules so there's room for people. You can have whatever rules you want. You can clean as much as you want if that's what you're into. But when you start to expect other people to do it your way is where the trouble comes in. Thanks, Alan. Um, Jeb. Jeb, can you unmute yourself and... Well, I can't hear you, Jeb, if you're talking. Oh, here we go. Let me come back to you, Jeb, and uh, you, Jeb. we'll ask Heather to talk, and then we'll come back to you, Jeb. Thank you so much. Um, hi, I'm Heather. I'm in recovery, and I'm in Prescott, Arizona. Um, yesterday was my 10 months. So awesome there. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I just, you know, I was in a very long term intensive kind of treatment. It was pretty cool and pretty grueling. And I've been out just a little over a month right now. And um, had some real upheaval at the first time I thought one place that was going to be decent for me was not and so I had to move to another place um so there's been a lot of upheaval to add to all the pain and crap I feel and um I'm almost crying on that it's pretty tough but one thing that is really bothering me because just now am I finally totally out on my own doing my shopping everything else I really am like, you know, this would be, maybe, maybe I can't, oh, who knows. But I know some of the difficulty I run into is with COVID and the way people are treating it. And, you know, I'm not trying to be political, but this is not really a political thing. It's a science thing. <laughs> and just when I see people not wearing masks or, you know, engaging, oh, like one of the first 12 step, I went to an in-person 12 step meeting a couple of times and I had, I just stopped because there's everybody in this enclosed space, no social distancing, no masks, you know, and I, I just, it, it just crawls up my spine and just knowing how many people have died and seeing that it makes me want to cry, especially when I think of how many people could have been saved. And I just don't know what to do. I mean, the one thing that gets me going is my social injustice injustice button. You push that, I'm ready to go off. <laughs> I'm a pretty decent, decently calm person. But when that happens, I'm just ready to, <laughs> ooh, sorry, <laughs> just ready to go. And um, to me, that's what I see going on here. And not only that, but it makes me frightened for the risk to me. And it's easy to say, I feel like it's a lot harder to say, you know, hey, I can't control people, places, and things. And I try to just do my best for myself. But quite honestly, I have to be regularly exposed. To okay, please who start don't. wrapping up. Oh, I'm sorry. But anyway, this is a very difficult thing for me to deal with. And I apparently could go on forever. <laughs> and yeah, any advice would be great. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. John T. 
Yeah, greetings everybody. My name is John, I'm an alcoholic and uh, grateful to be here today. And thank you, Mike G for passing this link on to me and keeping it brief. I uh, loved what the panel said. Uh, one or two of the captions uh, that grabbed me was one does not need to need to go to India. Um, I love that one. <laughs> and uh, it's all within my mind. Uh, the, the, the mantra that I have and I've had for many years is this is my life right now, whatever that means. That may be feeling very uncomfortable in the moment. And the key for me is not to fight the feeling, no matter how crappy it is, and because it will dissipate once I'm beside it and aware aware of it and not trying to push it away or even fight it. Um, boundaries, it's all about boundaries for me. I had a lovely conversation with my son who's coming up on five years sobriety. Um, he was in prison in England uh, in his first year of sobriety. And we've had some fantastic conversations. We're on boundaries right now. And it's just not that we made a plan. It's just a beautiful place to be. Boundaries are so important. Healthy boundaries, setting limits that are realistic for everybody involved. So it's holistic. It's not self-serving. And for me, I find that really works. And facts rather than opinion and expressing concern a lot is very healthy for me. That be all. Thank you. Thank you. Dale? Hi, I'm Dale. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, I found it quite interesting uh, what Alan said about encouraging his child to uh, think about themselves and how they feel, you know, regarding that art thing and everything. <clears throat> you know, I've always thought that, you know, you're supposed to say, oh, that's beautiful, that's wonderful, <laughs> you know, but uh, I was quite surprised uh, how that might affect. But anyway, in my own life, um, I have this uh, girlfriend and, and, and she's beautiful, quite, uh, you know, inside and out. And, um, but, you know, age is catching up to both of us. You know, I'm 71 and she's 66. And she doesn't see herself as physically beautiful anymore. Uh, so I always thought it was my job to tell her she's beautiful at every opportunity and compliment her beauty, you know, at every opportunity. And it's with Alan's comment about his child, I'm, I'm wondering if I'm not creating this, um, her vision of her beauty being dependent on what I think about it. Uh, and if, if I'm doing the wrong thing or if I should do that plus more or, or exactly what. So uh, I would like to hear some response to that. I'm going. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Go, Maria. Thanks, Dale. This is, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Thank you for bringing it up, Dale. Um, the matter of, on the matter of beauty, <clears throat> physical, visual, otherwise, um, I think you have you are spot on as a partner in thinking about does your does your partner need to be told this or is it perhaps time to step off and let her find that for herself? I don't. I mean, when I was younger, and you know, youth as we know is wasted on the young. When I was younger, I was terribly, terribly worried about visual impressions. You know, whether it was beauty or another kind of like I was going to be a strong teacher. I was going to walk in looking suit like or you know, however. But that visual presentation places the power, again, outside ourselves. It requires other people to feed an unfillable void in us to say, am I beautiful? But am I really beautiful? Am I beautiful? Anyone who's dealt with a woman who's like, do I look fat? Has dealt with, but do I look plump? Do I look a little bit plump? Do I look at all? I mean, like you can, God damn it, that whole sort of like any woman who has too many vocabulary words at her disposal can take you on a ride with that. Beauty is similar. And if one asks other people to think about what do you mean by beauty? You know, what do you even mean by that? You know, what, what part of beauty are you not understanding? Like, what does, be, what does it mean to you? When you look in the mirror, are you able to go, I look freaking amazing. Cause like getting to an age where you get to say that to yourself, it's like, thank God I'm done with youth because that was tiresome. And when you can like decenter and get decenter in other people's ideas, whether it's a physical beauty or another type of beauty, when you can get out of what, I'm only beautiful if you think so, that's garbage. I'm beautiful whether you're there or not. 
tree falls in the woods still makes a sound as far as I'm concerned. And so like in that same way, it doesn't require other people to feed this void in us. If I wait for you or drugs or perception or ego to fill this void, I'll be waiting a very, very deeply long time and it will be very lonely. And so one of the things that I wanna to say to that is there's a 10 year old girl in my life and her dad keeps telling her how beautiful she is. And I'm finally like, do you know what your daughter likes? He's like, well, you know, toys and stuff. I'm like, she doesn't like toys. She likes drawing. Like, tell her, are you drawing today? What did you do? What did you make? Did you enjoy it? Did you make a mess? Did you make a big mess? That's awesome. So reframing how we respond to the people in our lives really shapes their ability to center themselves as well. I'll stop. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Maria. Let me jump in on this, John, because I... Uh, okay. Be the last thing I could share, and I want to I want to also say something to Heather real quick. But Dale, listen. First of all, um, I just listened to the process and how much you love her and care about her, and that's what stands out. And if I were you, that's what I would emphasize more than trying to make her okay. You say, look, you know, I I I feel so much pain when I hear you talk about yourself like this because I experience you so differently. And I, I hope there's some way you can find a way to start to come to grips with whatever is making you not be able to see yourself in a different way. And whatever I can do to support that process, I want to because I love you and I think you of you is beautiful. But you can't see yourself with my eyes, you're seeing yourself with yours. And so I'd like to try to figure that out with you and encourage you to figure it out. See, that's more to the point for me, instead of just trying to fix it, right, is to get to the process of it. And that's the issue there. For you, Heather, is what you were talking about. You see, I think what you need to do is have a dialogue with social injustice. Because there's something you're projecting here. I don't know what it is, but I would put social injustice in an empty chair and I would say what I want to say to it. And then I'd have you switch over and play social injustice and respond to Heather and see what that dialogue is going to turn into. Because there's something going on here that's more an issue that you're struggling with in your life that's not integrated. And I don't know what it means. I'm not that smart to figure that out. But I do know there's a process you can put yourself in where you can discover what it means to you. It means something. It's not just an objective thing. There's some personal meaning here involved and related to something in your life that's painful. So I'm going to check out here in a minute. Uh, I got an hour and a half in the gas tank right now and my gas is, gauge is saying empty. So I need to take care of myself. I'm going to leave this open for you guys and then I will see you when we get back together and hopefully I'll be further along in my recovery then. Thanks, Thank Alan. You. And please, Thanks, Alan. please take care of yourself. And Thanks, Alan. Thank you. Thank you. Alan. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alan. Thank you everyone, for your support. Thanks, Alan. Thank this you. Has been brilliant. Just Thank brilliant. You. Okay, let's Thank go. You. To, Thanks so much. Let's go to Angela. Have a great we're not. Week. We're not done yet. Alan just has. Oh, to leave. Thank you. We're <laughs> not done. Alan's just leaving because he's recovering from COVID and he needs to get his oh, rest. Yeah. So, um, Annette, would you like to go? Hi, <laughs> um, Annette from Brooklyn. Um, I was just going to actually ask a question um, about Dr. Berger's um, um, thing, his seminar, I guess. <laughs> um, I was just going to ask, like, you know, for a couple that's in their 40s, you know, you're talking about emotional dependency, and I can see so much of that in myself and my husband. And so I was just curious, like, what steps do you take to break those habits? Because I guess you were saying a lot about it, you know, and, and, and um, you know, subconsciously, and I realized it really was subconsciously, like, oh, my God, I do that, I do that, you know? Oh, and by the way, I'm so sorry to hear about your COVID. I heard about that last night. So uh, I was so worried, but I'm glad you're okay. <laughs> so, yeah, that was just my question. Like, how do you change those ways? Thanks, Annette. Mm -hmm. Um would Joe or Mario like to? Well, I, I would say one of the things that struck me, and this is I'm just dealing with, you know, new information or something I'd forgotten that I'd heard about before. I'm not quite sure. But the idea that to the extent that I don't know me, I don't know what my triggers are. I don't know what my needs are. I don't even realize what 
like what's really going on, like what, what we, in my interplay and in my interaction with my loved ones, right? And so, you know, the, the sort of inward eyeballs can be very helpful in sort of going, why did that trigger me? Why, did, why am I upset? Um, what, what's really going on for me, right? And, um, and the other thing that I do is I try to not be the star in my show and sort of see myself as my role in other people's lives, right? right. You know? And uh, sponsees don't have to take my advice, right? They, they don't have to <laughs> live with, as Joe sees it, you know, they can just carry on their life as, uh, as they see fit. And, uh, and I got to sort of know my place and, and know me. Uh, over to you, Maria. <laughs> That's I good. Was I was just going to post on there that there is an interesting group people might be interested in, those who are in relationships, uh, called Recovering Couples Anonymous. I don't know, many people have never heard of it, but it's, um, it's actually pretty powerful. And the program allows for couples of any gender orientation, sexual orientation, whatever, to uh, work the steps as a couple. It's quite something. Um, I'm not, I'm not currently engaged because I'm not currently part of a couple, but it's, it's, uh, it, it, it takes couples to a different spot. And so that's, um, that's something I would look into is that, that boundaries and dependency that can be undone within the relationship. Uh, it can happen. I've seen it happen. And I, um, I wish you the best with that. The other thing I might mention uh, for anyone who's fairly new in recovery, um, some of this is, we call it stage two recovery. It's, uh, and so I hope no one puts uh, a real high expectation on themselves or on their loved ones about this, because in my experience, it takes quite a bit of time to get to a point where I can actually handle some of these kinds of, of, uh, uh, of issues. Uh, I, had to, I had to just get sober. <laughs> for the first several years and do the best I could not to destroy other people's lives with my insanity. Um, I don't know how to pronounce Bahia. That was that excellent. Right? You did. That was an excellent pronunciation. <laughs> um, I'm not going to, I just wanted to speak to the lady who had had a couple of losses. Um, when I came in uh, to the fellowship, uh, one of the people that I knew, had, his son had died in his arms in his driveway. Uh, a few years later, he actually ran over his own grandson and killed him. Um, another friend in the program's seven-year-old daughter was brutally murdered. Another friend lost two of her children back to back. Another friend, two of her sons were murdered. So as I watch them walk through those experiences and stay sober, I knew that there was really hardly any excuse that I could find uh, to pick up again. So when it came my turn to lose a couple of nephews that I was really close to, I, I knew what to do. And that was to pick up the phone, to get to a meeting, and to share what was going on with me because there are folks all over that know that feeling to have something ripped from your chest um, and still be able to pick up other tools rather than a, a drink or a drug. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you very much. Thank you. I see Jeb is back. Would you like to give it another shot, Jeb? I'm sure. My name is Jeb and I'm a grateful recovered alcoholic. I've been having problems with my audio, so I had to, well, reboot. Uh, I just want to say how grateful I am to this group and to Alan, Joe, and Maya for, uh, Maria, for <laughs> this invigorating, uh, thoughtful meeting today. Uh, and it just, it, it just verifies to me how how grateful I am to Bill Wilson in those early years for having such insight into the solution and presenting it for me. Uh, I think probably the most important step for me in my daily life is step four, which I learned when I was working on my first step, 
first first step, I had a visit from a friend who'd become a Buddhist monk, and he explained to me that the fourth step was all about finding who and what I am. Gave me the assignment to stand in front of the mirror for 15 minutes every morning, looking myself in the eye and say, James Earl Barrett, who are you? James Earl Barrett, who are you? And I have continued that, and it's only recently, with 42 years of sobriety, that I've realized that this whole recovery journey for me has one of identity formation. And I, I've been through that so many times because I have out of that four step, a sane and sound ideal for my future relationships, which is what I bring into all of my relationships, including that with myself. But I know all the things that, that, uh, that Alan presented there are the things that stood in the way of that, the, the memories that I've internalized. And I appreciate it. He is mentioning some and quoting some of my heroes like Fitz Pearls, Victor Frankel, Karen Horney, Virginia Satir, Virginia Satir. And I don't know if he mentioned uh, Robert Mate, but he fits into this whole picture for me. So what is it? 15,426 days, one day at a time. So thanks. Goodbye. <laughs> thanks, Jeb. Randy. I'm Randy, alcoholic. Hey, Randy. I am really enjoying this and I needed it. Uh, I would like to say first on that topic of loss, the person that lost two dear members recently. Uh, I try to live my life on the premise that nothing is so bad that a drink can't make it worse. And those are not just words that really is true. And one of the reasons I keep going to meetings is to see what other people can go through and stay sober. And I can't imagine anything that could happen to someone that I haven't seen someone stay sober through, including their own death. I mean, of course you're sober after you die, but we had like four members of our uh, free thinkers group that we lost in the last few years. Uh, we lost them within a year, I think. And uh, they died more bravely than any religious people I've ever seen in my whole life. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that I noticed as soon as this started, I kind of relate real quickly my experience with being a member of AA, and I think it's similar to many others. I was raised with Southern Baptist religion crammed down my throat and I walked away from it in my teen years and started drinking. And almost 20 years later, I was beaten to my knees and came to AA. Well, I wasn't interested in religion, but I was beaten so bad that I just swallowed whatever they fed me. And I repeated what I was told for years. And then that became country came. I didn't like it anymore. And I was in the Ozarks of Arkansas, super religious and, uh, I thought I was going to have to leave AA and I moved to Arizona and I found the Freethinkers group in Cottonwood and uh, for a while it was like I just wanted to bash religious people because I had been bashed so much and anyway as soon as this started with Alan talking it was refreshing to see that others agree there was tremendous wisdom in stuff that Bill wrote there's still tremendous wisdom in the big book the 12 steps still are wonderful way to look at yourself and have a different outlook on life. Uh, I don't need to throw the big book out with the bathwater and all the beautiful sayings in there. It just needs to be, I don't need their God, but the principles, the principles of AA, I believe in totally. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Randy. Tim. I'm Tim, a recovering alcoholic. Um, the one statement that that Alan shared that really jumped out at me was Byron Katie's remark that if I'm at war with reality, it hurts. Um, I met a wonderful friend, Tom, on my second AA meeting nearly four years ago. And Tom was starting his long saga uh, dealing with lung cancer. And he had an emotional sobriety about that that was better than anything I've ever seen. I, you know, it's an interesting combination of 
living in the now, accepting the now and not trying to fight an ongoing war against it, but also maintaining a hope and a belief that recovery might happen, uh, or at least recognizing that that struggle won't last forever, that it's just the now. And uh, that same kind of truth of emotional sobriety comes out of a lot of the survivors of concentration camps, the people that maintained this balance between living in the now and accepting it, but not being at war with it and, and staying in the hope that things would change or could change is really the crux of emotional sobriety. I, I hope I get better at that. Thanks very much for the seminar. Thanks, Tim. It's good to Thanks, see you. Tim. Brian? You're still muted, Brian. So sorry, I was miming. I'm Brian. I'm a uh, reformed booze hound. Um, and geez, I wish Mr. Berger had stayed because I, I wanted to pose this question of him. I'm looking at my 12 and 12. I pulled this out because I had to dust it off because I, I used it way back when. I used to sit in step meetings and <clears throat> get bored and, 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 and go through the text with my inner or outer accountant. And I now understand I'm an agnostic. I'm not, I'm not an atheist. I don't proclaim to know what can't in fact be known. So um, is it improbable perhaps, but I just don't know. And, and I don't think, you know, the, 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 the appeal to agnostic AA to me is that I don't think there is a God can imagine he, she, or it had anything to do with me picking up my first drink or putting down my last one. But <clears throat> here's, here, here's where I'm getting a little hung up. It's because it's I'm, I'm, even though I'm a numbers geek, I love words. <clears throat> I like numbers, I love words. Emotional sobriety. If one is not emotion, emotional so sober, it seems to mean that one is emotionally drunk or emotionally impaired. Um, um, via an intoxicant. So maybe I, I, I get a little hung up on that. And I see, I was, I was searching the chapter for, where is it, where is it, where is it? As if, as if this were, okay, this was Bill Wilson's great leaving off point, his great legacy of his 12 and 12. It's, 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 it's in the first uh, paragraph um, of a 20 page chapter and uh, way back when I was so bored in, in the meeting, this 12 and 12, 20 page chapter has six, 16 mentions of God, four mentions of God as we understood him, three of higher power, uppercase, higher power, and six pronouns, he, his, him, himself. So there are 29 mentions of God and including here on page 109, three pages in, from great numbers of such experiences, we could predict that the doubter who still claimed that he hadn't gotten the spiritual angle, unquote, and who, can st who still considered his well-loved AA group the higher power, lowercase h and lowercase p, would presently love God and call him by name. Page 20, we close with the Page 120, we 125, excuse me, we close with God grant us the serenity. So I'm and now I'm I'm hung up how emotional sobriety is about matters psychological. When I know, for instance, Ernest Kurtz, <clears throat> a, 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 a darling of the secular AA movement, when he had a powwow on YouTube with three minutes. Brian, okay. can you start and wrap it up, please? Uh, uh, may, may, maybe, uh, can I ask, can I ask that this, this at least be addressed, and, and maybe by, by Joe, I'm scratching notes seriously. Joe said, we seculars, we rely more on our intellectual prowess. So help me out, Joe, please. Sure. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I won't play, this is what Alan would say, but we'll be back in two, in two more months, and uh, we can probably have that answer directly answered directly by him. But I would say this, I totally scrub for my own personal recovery, the whole spiritual malady thing away. I think 
that uh, my alcoholism is physical, mental, and emotional. And, and everything I hear from people about their spiritual experience, how they feel dread or terror or regret or angst or joy or awe, they're all expressing emotions to me. Like that's what I hear. If there's something supernatural going on with that, that I'm not seeing, I can live with that. But, but, but the only way I can relate to them is on an emotional level. And I don't rely too heavily on literal interpretations of uh, our older literature because I, um, I seem to get uh, my own emotional instability <laughs> going there. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, like I'm a writer and I tell people, write it in your own language. Like, you know, forget about what someone wrote uh, who, you know, uh, grew up like he's a Victorian. Bill Wilson was born before uh, the you know, 1900 happened. And, you know, he had certain ways of seeing things and, and many people have uh, spoke about it now. And, and you could like just, yeah, forget about trying to follow somebody else's holy writ. That's what I would say. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, and Joe. the other thing I found is that um, it's more important for me to find out what's going on inside of me than to determine the right or the wrong of what somebody wrote 40 years ago. Um, Kenji. Hi there, I'm Kenji. I'm an addict alcoholic. Um, this is my um, seventh day back from an extended hardcore relapse. Um, and this, this today's been just fantastic. It's um, just what I needed to hear. Um, my second meeting back on Wednesday night, I went to um, the group that used to be my home group. And um, it's a men's group that has feedback. Um, and um, the feedback I got when I checked in was, um, take the cotton out of your ears and put it in your mouth, be seen and not heard for a while, pretend you know nothing and do what you're told from one person. And I mean, we've all heard those things at a meeting at one time or another, if we've been around for a while. Usually said like, we used to say that. And um, anyway, it was, I got bent out of shape. I, I resented that guy, I resented the meeting, even though it was just that one individual. And I fumed about it for days. And um, this, and I, and now I see from having heard Alan's talk that I that I totally did what he was talking about. And um, um, I was just a mess, which is, I guess, understandable being 72 hours sober and feeling pretty beat up. Um, <clears throat> but um, I got so much out of this today. At least a couple of Alan's slides were quotes from step four in um, the 12 and 12 that I found really fascinating. Because when I think of step four into 12 and 12, I think seven deadly sins, not relevant to me, not my thing, um, some good for somebody else. And um, having heard those quotes that he made today, I'm thinking maybe I need to take another look at step four and leave what I don't relate to. And um, that there's obviously some good stuff there that I don't remember about, um, quieting the my upset first um anyway it's been fantastic today thanks a lot all right thank you judy thank you. hi i'm judy from north carolina i'm an addict and i'm so glad i found aa secular aa um and i just want to put in a plug for a couple of books here this is a real good one. And you can look up grief or any other topic in which you're interested in the index and find six or eight quotes. And then Joe C's commentary, which will help you. This book will help you. This book is by another member of our group here. Dale wrote this book and it's the first 100 and 64 pages of the big book with the God taken out and his personal commentary. And um, it is non-sexist, uh, it won't offend, and it's, um, 
it's beautifully written because it's the big book, <laughs> but without, without the God. So we have so many wonderful secular books to help us. And, and I'm so grateful for the secular meetings and I appreciate the work that you've gone to to put this together for all of us. And thank you, I'll see you again. Thanks, Judy. Karen? Oh, by the way, I posted uh, Joe's book title in the chat with a link to his site. Is that me, John? That's you. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen. I'm an alcoholic from London. Um, this is my first ever uh, emotional sobriety webinar, and I've really enjoyed it so far. It's been very interesting. Um, for me, um, the, the term emotional sobriety, I quite like when somebody compared it to being emotionally drunk, because I think that I fluctuate in between both. Um, I'm going to switch my video off because I think I'm breaking up. Um, yeah, so it's about, for me, um, and it's not, it's not easy, like I don't think it just comes easy. And Alan made a good point of sort of describing it, how our parents really <laughs> messed that up for us um, from an early age. Um, so I'm sort of relearning it now, um, getting better at it slowly since I've stopped drinking alcohol. Um, but yeah, it's just being more aware of my emotions, recognising how I'm feeling, uh, maybe not even trying to change it, you know, just sort of sitting with it. If I'm upset, I'm upset. If I'm happy, I'm happy being more kind of accepting of, of it. I know mindfulness is a, you know, a term everyone here, well, a lot of you probably know about it. Um, and I find that that helps uh, meditating, even if it's just for five minutes every day. Um, it certainly has some positive impact on me. Um, and, and of course, writing stuff down, journaling stuff maybe um, has helped. So anyway, I want to shut up now because there's a load of us here, um, but it was great great um to come along and listen to everybody so thank you thanks for letting me share thank you and thank you everybody for being here i really appreciate it and on behalf of the free thinkers living sober group in the verde valley i'd like to not only welcome you but thank you for being here i want to mention that our next workshop is going to be at the same hour on january 31st mm -hmm. Joe's Joe C. will be uh, presenting on Sober Enough, Emotional Sobriety as a Range, Not a Contest. Um, the dates after that are going to be the last Sundays in March and May. We have a feedback page on our website. It's dedicated to emotional sobriety. Um, and that link should be in the chat already. Um, we also appreciate your feedback and any ideas you might have for future endeavors. Our base website is freethinkerslivingsober.org. There isn't any charge for this workshop, but we appreciate any contributions people might, might want to make. Um, please select for webinar from the drop down list on the PayPal page. And we also want to really thank uh, uh, Joe and Alan and Maria for being with us today. And a special thank you to our backstage helpers, John S. and Kat L. We couldn't have done this without them. I guarantee you that. Uh, if you want more information at us, uh, about us, you can certainly get it at the website. The videos from the past are available. And this one, we will be posting the audio portion at some point when I can get around to it. Um, but the past videos are available also on our YouTube channel. We have additional links which should have been posted in the chat for Maria and Alan Berger and Joe. And for if you want to contact us, just send it to freethinkerscottonwood at gmail.com. Again, thank you all very much for being here. I really appreciate it. Joe, do you have any last words you'd like to put in or Maria? I was going to let Marty go first. You know I hate that. Okay, fine. It is so wonderful to be here, you guys. Thank you. I'm super excited to see uh, see you guys next month, or I guess a month and a bit, uh, at Joe's talk on Sober Enough. And I will see you all soon. Thank you so much for being here.
Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Maria. Yeah. Okay, I, Joe, you're last. You know. Yeah, a couple <laughs> other things to uh, help get us through uh, sort of a pandemic sobriety. Uh, the International Conference of Secular AA will be the uh, 5th of uh, December. That is like next week. That is like six days away. And uh, it's, it's a cram-packed uh, program. We hope to have a copy of the program so people can plan accordingly. But it kicks off at uh, noon Eastern and it'll run 4.35ish. Uh, We're having an after party uh, so it'll sort of go as long as it goes. And um, uh, Higher Palooza 6 will uh, put on by our friends in Cleveland uh, will be um, on the 20th of December. Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure uh, uh, that'll be that. So correct. Uh, uh, one day at a time, we'll be back together again soon. Thank you, Joe. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, John. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow, John. <laughs> well, thanks. I really needed that because I don't have much emotional sobriety and I need all the praise I can get. <laughs> oh, you're wonderful, John. Oh, John, you're the man. Oh, you're the man. Oh, you're such a man, yeah. Are you married? Oh, I can't take it. I got to leave now. <laughs> uh, we love you. Oh, oh, thank you, buddy. Yeah, you did a great Thanks. job. Thanks so you much. You did, as always. <laughs> Bye. 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 everyone. It was brilliant. Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much. Thank you. <laughs> See you at the next one. Yeah, on yep. Definitely. Thank you all. This is wonderful. Hey, Ron. Hey. Bye. Hey, Joe. Good to see you always. Uh, as always, yep. Head hey, Ron. The, yeah. Head for the I casino, thought you were going to speak today. <laughs> I don't know how I missed this. I had the wrong <laughs> time. Aww. Well, it will be. It has been recorded, and it will be posted. Yep. Uh, so there, so, life is full when, of second when is the chances. Next one? When when is the next one? January thirty first. Twenty ninth. Oh, okay. I did write that down. Same same um, password and everything. Uh, good question. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't know the answer. <laughs> For the flyer. Well, okay. I, you, I'll just fuck Joe about it in the meeting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll get it figured out. How many participants did you have? 155. Uh, no, it started like over 100. What's 100 at one point? 155, she said. Yeah. yeah. Oh, 155. And when Alan left, people thought it was over, so a bunch of people yeah. left. <laughs> I'm going to have to talk to Alan about that. <laughs> okay, I'll have to catch you next time. Okay, Jennifer. Yeah, that's great. Jennifer, catch you the next time. It's great. I'm sorry we missed you. Or you missed us. You know what? I thought it was four hours. You know what, guys? I thought this was going yeah, on thought, for four hours. I'm, I'm so disappointed. I, I, could have just, I thought I knew you were going to speak. I'm not feeling very emotionally sober now, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, there's a great no, it was, it was New York I would but recommend. I thought... It's on the Google sheet. <laughs> okay. Get yourself to the no, I thought Joe and Myra were going to talk. <laughs> I thought Joe and going to talk, no. too. <laughs> It was really cool. Thank you. Thanks so much. Well, our last one was longer, and some people it thought really... it was just too much for oh, the average I thought it flew by. I thought it flew by. <laughs> it was four hours, but it flew by. Cause and it so and Joe will be talking at the next one, and then we'll oh, okay. panel will still have some interaction after that, just like this one. And then oh. Maria will talk that next, that one, and then I'll talk at the last one. So, you know, oh, okay. miss the last one, but... The... <laughs> I was actually, okay. he said I'm talking. I haven't decided yet. I'll either be talking <laughs> or doing interpretive dance. <laughs> I like that idea. I'm doing a guitar. I'm doing a guitar. <laughs> oh, I'll be playing you know, the guitar for time, him while he dances. <laughs> one, one time in, in London on New Year's Eve, I went to an AA uh, party on New Year's Eve in London, because I'm in London. And um, there was a band playing in the meeting. So basically, after every oh, meeting, um, somebody would just start rocking out on their guitar. It was fantastic. <laughs> I was like, oh, I wish every AA could meet, meeting could be like this. 
So here you go. That's a little tip for yeah. you. Anyway, um, <laughs> I'm off now, guys. Lovely to see, lovely to see all your lovely faces. Take yeah. it easy. See you online soon. Are you guys coming Bye. tonight to the 7 p.m. traditions thing from the Higher Palooza people? Oh, right. That's, uh, seven. That's what tonight. The, put the, put the link seven. in there, Annette. We got it okay, in there, Joe, um, a couple times. Okay, because I'm not okay. home. I'm walking right now. <laughs> I do have it, though. <laughs> but that's tonight at 7 to 8.30. Eastern time? Yeah, Eastern Eastern time, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure it's on the WhatsApp. I, I haven't been Yeah, it's, it's on their, the, the Freethinkers website, too. Yeah. I guess it's too confused. The Cleveland or the Cottonwood, whichever. It wasn't this one. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in... Uh, having some discussion at some point about um, anonymity and uh, whether there might be some um, last two days in Arizona. Mm -hmm. I, I missed that. Go what? on, anonymity? Well, just uh, a reinterpretation of anonymity for modern times, if that's even necessary. Mm -hmm. Right. I know a that lot of old timers hate the problem. idea, but <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but then as an old timer, no, right, I'm right. always open to talking about new things. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, like people will uh, bitch someone out. A the uh, the traditions aren't weapons. You can't be using them to <laughs> against people because you what? can't do that because of the <laughs> Yeah, yeah, this is uh, this just then. <laughs> <laughs> Half the people in service um, would quit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, it's one of my favorite lines. There are no rules in AA, and uh, there's a hundred people in this meeting that'll explain them to you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That's true. That's true. <laughs> uh, but that goes to what Alan said, right? You know, like uh, like labeling people means you're setting rules for everybody, right? Right. <laughs> but I'm well, I heard it. You do include not to be mean to other people, though. That doesn't mean you can be mean to everybody, you know. <laughs> I heard a speaker one time when he was talking about the steps and this and that, and periodically he would say, that's just my opinion, but it should be your opinion too. And I thought he was joking. <laughs> and then I realized he wasn't joking. He meant it. <laughs> well, it was funny. I was reading actually Joe's book the other day and it was talking about how, you know, do we read a new book and then, you know, oh, this is great for recovery. This is that, you know, we change our mind all the time. You know, from the influence, I'm like, oh, he's so right. And I'm like, wait a minute, am I being influenced by Joe? <laughs> you know, because <laughs> I'm like, it's the same thing. You know, I'm like, oh gosh, I do that, <laughs> but I'm doing that right now by listening to what Joe wrote. <laughs> so. Yeah, you got to be careful with some of that stuff he put in there. I mean, you know, it's you really got to think about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Much thank you for me, Joe. <laughs> yeah. I was finally encouraged to look in the back of the book for how many entries there are for an emotional sobriety. I've never looked at it, but that's my homework for this afternoon to read all 12 of them, whatever it is. Thank you, Joe. I'm so glad you came, Dad. Good evening, everybody. Oh, what a group. Okay. I'm off to do more AA service. Mike, <laughs> it was great, guys. you'll be sorry, but I'll be in touch with you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys so much. That was awesome. Yeah. Uh, no, no worries. Thanks, thanks Joe. One. Thanks, Joe. And we'll thank you, you, John, and Joe, for Joe, I'll helping see you us Monday. here. <laughs> yeah. Really appreciate it. It was fun. <laughs> and you are still the host, so yep. when you're Sorry. ready to end the meeting... You All right, shall go I go ahead and end it? I okay. think it's good time. Catch y'all later. Bye-bye. All right, thanks, John. <laughs> Bye, guys. Peace out. Thank you. That was awesome. Love y'all. Thanks.